So, um, uh, I'm supposed to talk with you with the problem of long-term development um, of the Russian economy. And um, I think that one of the most important problems, at the very least, uh, one problem which is uh, coming from the history of transition and after 1998, of the relation between macroeconomic policy and institution building in Russia. Uh, you know that uh, for the last 20 years, uh, people have described what is called a, an economic trajectory, uh, an economic path, um, as a kind of mix uh, of influence between institutions and uh, macroeconomic policy. The experience of Russia, at the very least what I am um, finding in uh, in this experience, is the fact that uh, without good institutions, uh, without a sufficiently reliable framework of institutions, you can have any good macroeconomic policy. Of course, even with a very good institutional framework, uh, you are not sure to have good economic policy. But with a bad institutional framework, you have no choice but to have very, very bad uh, macroeconomic policy. So after that, uh, you will probably ask me, OK, what are you defining as good institutional framework or bad institutional framework? I, I don't want uh, to be uh, too much normative, but I think that three main criteria are defining uh, what are uh, good institutions by, or more precisely, uh, making the difference between good institutions and bad institutions. The first point is the fact that uh, institutions um, which are not organizing cooperation in a sustainable way are not good institutions. It's extremely important to understand that basically economics is a game of coordination and cooperation. Because uh, the capitalist economy or the developed capitalist economy or whatever the name uh, you will give uh, to it is an economy which implies cooperation and coordination between its actors. Uh, my late professor uh, and I will say uh, my first master Maybe some of you are knowing uh, this very, no, not so old, by the way, in the late uh, 60s or the early uh, 70s, um, this uh, Soviet movie, The First Master. Anyone? Who would? Okay. <laughs> too bad. <laughs> right. Oh, too bad. Well, um, uh, my first master, uh, Professor Charles Bettelheim, uh, was giving the following definition uh, to a capitalist economy. It's first an, ec an economy where actors are divided, are separated themselves. That is, uh, any consumer has no direct links with any producer. This is the first point. And this is, by the way, uh, this kind of separation is defining uh, what can be uh, called uh, a trade economy. But then he went to head, and after that you have, of course, the separation between labor and capital. These two separations are extremely important to understand, first, what is capitalism, and the second point, of course, to understand that any economy is basically a kind of cooperation game. So, if institutions are not stabilizing in some kind of reliant form, of course not for hundreds of years, but at the very least onto a, a kind of human vision that are not stabilizing uh, cooperation, they are not good institutions. The second point is the fact that institutions uh, that don't precise economic rights 
into a, in a sustainable way are not good institutions. And economic rights, uh, property rights, uh, is not a kind of distinct way to speak about individual property. Actually, property rights apply to, to state property. You have to understand that the problem is not to know who is owning a factory uh, or something like that. But the real point is to know who is owning what. And if the who is describing the state, it is not a problem. But by the way, property rights have to be very precisely defined. And by extension, um, economic rights have to be defined in a quite precise way. And I'm not to say that this implies a very specific form of definition. Of course, as a citizen uh, and also as an economist, I would prefer some form of definition to others. But this is not my point. My point is to say that uh, any institutions which are not defining or which are not organizing precisely economic rights is not a good institution. And the third point is, of course, the problem of political legitimacy. If institutions are not politically legitimate, they are exactly of no use. It's extremely important because in the current world, um, the word of legitimacy is not frequently used. It is not used at all by economists. It's even not frequently used um, by social politists or by people engaged into political science. Nevertheless, it's extremely important that it has a distinct meaning by comparison with legality. You can have some legal institutions which are not legitimate. You can have sometimes institutions which are legitimate but which are not legal. And you have to understand that in the process of understanding, of course legality is important. I'm not to say that a rule of law is of no use. No, it's in, it is important. But it is not the end of the world. And if you have to choose between legality and legitimacy, choose always legitimacy. It's extremely important to understand that. Just look what was the system in South Africa under the apartheid. Under the apartheid, you have institutions that we are despising, like all the institutions linked with the separation of race, which were perfectly legal under the South African system. So you could understand that, that the problem of legality will always be minor by comparison with the problem of legitimacy. So let me now to figure this kind of three criteria. You have here the criteria of cooperation. You have here the criteria of economic rights. And you have here the criteria of legitimacy. Here, the criteria is absolutely uh, fully uh, and in an expanding way um, created. Here, it is no more relevant. So you will see that if you had a system where cooperation and economic rights are well defined, but this system is without any legitimacy for social reasons or 
because of social conflicts. Because the conflicts uh, existing in this given society are turning this society apart. Uh, this will not work. At the same time, if you are here in a situation where cooperation is, is well defined and legitimacy is also well defined, but where economic rights are not well defined, this situation is not in the long term uh, vi viable. Uh, this was the situation of most, if not of all, uh, socialist economies in Soviet time economies. And uh, when I am to speak of socialist economies, I am speaking only of Soviet type economies. In socialist economies, uh, economic rights were largely blurred. Uh, nobody really knows uh, what was uh, owning what. And even in state property, you had a lot of confusion between what was the property of the party, what was the property of the national state, what was the property of the local authorities. So it ended up into a very uh, unstable and inefficient system. The same problem here. You have on this point good legitimacy, uh, good economic rights, but cooperation is not really organized. Uh, that could define, to some extent, uh, the current situation of a lot of Western economies. And uh, this is no more a uh, viable situation. So actually, where you will have to be is here. But it's extremely important to understand that another way of defining uh, the problem of what is a good or a bad institution is to look where the situation is not sustainable. And if you have cooperation and economic rights without legitimacy, this is not politically sustainable. If you have cooperation and good legitimacy, but no good definition of economic rights. This, is, this will not be economically sustainable, at least in the long term. Because in short term, uh, you could have uh, some kind of viability. Um, if you are here between legitimacy and economic rights, but without a really good organization of cooperation in the system, this will be no more uh, sustainable again in the long run. So this is the first problem. The second problem, of course, is to understand what are bad policies. Of course, we have all um, in our heads uh, a kind of definition of what are bad policies or uh, what are the reasons uh, we are considering some policies to be bad. Um, again, um, I'm to warn you not to be uh, too much normative uh, on this point, uh, just because uh, people can have other ID than your own, uh, and also because you could be mistaken. Uh, ever think to that. So, uh, policies are to be bad if first they are unable to achieve a good balance between short and long term. This is absolutely important uh, if you are looking to things like investment, consumptions, savings. But it's also extremely important uh, when you are looking uh, to the branch development of an economy. Um, any policies uh, putting too much emphasis on some branch of the economy and not looking uh, at other branch or not looking sufficiently at uh, other branch could lead to very bad economic decision because uh, 
Of course, you can't understand, you can know what is to be the situation of your economy in the next three or five years. But in the next 20 years, it is much more difficult. Uh, imagine that uh, you are in the board of directors of the Pratt & Whitney company, not now, not in the previous century, but at the end of the 19th century. What was the main job of the Pratt & Whitney company by then? OK, two things. First, horse carriage, and the second, spinning mills. If the direction, if the board of directors of this company have been only been thinking uh, along the line of developing more efficient horse carriage or developing more efficient spinning mills, the Pratt & Whitney company will not exist anymore. So you have, be it at the state level or at a large company level, uh, to achieve this kind of balance between long term and short term. Of course, uh, in, the sh in the short term, would the Pratt & Whitney company have not developed efficient spinning mills or efficient horse carriage, the company would have gone bankrupt. So uh, would have been not in a position to project it into the long term. Uh, the second problem is, of course, achieving a kind of sustainable balance uh, between uh, saving and consumption, uh, between investment and saving, and more precisely, uh, following what can be called the golden rule uh, of the sharing of productivity gains. And here again, it's extremely important to understand when you are to look onto the history, onto the economic history since uh, the late 40s of the previous century uh, till uh, the late 80s. One of the main reasons uh, of the very stable growth and the very high growth uh, which was achieved uh, in countries like Germany, France, Italy, uh, by the way, if there have been one economic miracle in Europe, it's certainly not Germany, it's probably not France, it's Italy. Because Italy was in 1945 what could be called now a kind of third world country, actually. Uh, and this so-called third world country transform itself from 1945 onto the 1960s into a very highly developed industrial countries. In these times, the sharing of productivity gains, the sharing of the value added was following more or less a kind of golden rule of sharing. This golden rule of sharing was not coming from any decision made by the top. It was the result of constant fighting between the wage earners and the owners uh, of the large companies. But in this constant fighting, a kind of equilibrium, or at least a kind of balance, I don't like uh, very much uh, the word of equilibrium. A kind of balance was achieved. And what is extremely important to understand was well, that uh, by the, the end of the 1970s uh, and the 1980s, this balance was more or less destroyed. And because of this situation, the sharing of productivity gain, the sharing of the value added, was distorted. And economies 
went out of track and out of uh, this pattern of uh, fast growth and high growth, achieving also quite a good distribution of wealth um, as a result. The third point defining a bad policies is when policies are be they by intent or by result, because uh, we have first to look at effects of politics by results, and after to ask ourselves, was this result coming from intent made at first or not? So uh, policy uh, which by intent or by results are resulting into uh, a huge preference for a given social group for just one reason. Uh, all our societies are not homogeneous. They are all uh, divided into different kinds of social groups. The problem is that homogeneity is achieved only through a political process and as a result it's never a condition it's ever a kind of result but any policy aiming at fostering one social group to the expense of other is certainly a bad policy because by destroying this process, this political process of creating homogeneity from an heterogeneous society, it will give birth to social conflicts which are to torn apart the society. So, having said that, let me now uh, go back uh, to the Russian economic situation. Uh, and well, I assume that most of you were not born by 1989-1990. So uh, you have never lived in a world where it there was something called Soviet Union. I had lived in this world. <laughs> uh, and I have began um, uh, my studies of the Soviet economy, then uh, making the switch onto the Russian economy. In the last 20, uh, 25 years, I think that the most important uh, movement, or the most important phenomenon, was of course uh, the 1998 crash. Uh, this crash not only, by the way, affected Russia, but it affected also Western countries alike, and it was part of a much more general uh, crisis of finance, which began actually into Southeast Asia. Uh, if you look at the kind of historical development, uh, the crisis began um, in Korea, then moved from Korea to Taiwan. After that, it implied some very high disturbance into Malaysia and Indonesia. And then, and because it was quite interesting, this Asian crisis, as it was uh, called by then, had no real effect uh, onto uh, the Western economies. Or more precisely, they had only one effect. It was a drop in oil prices, for very simple reasons. Uh, a country of East Asia where high consumers of fuel, gasoline, uh, diesel oil, and things like that. Uh, with the crisis, the demand dropped, and then the price dropped. Not very much, but they dropped nevertheless by 20 or 25 percent. But then we had 
um, the Russian crisis. And this crisis created chaos uh, in the global finance. Uh, Wall Street was just at one, one point of going bankrupt. And it was saved because uh, huge banks and huge investment funds were bailed out by the Federal Reserve. But after this crisis, the crisis moved on to Latin America. You had the Brazilian crash and then the Argentinian crash. So this crisis changed to some extent uh, the situation about the global finance. And for most of my colleagues working on finance, it was the end of innocence. Or more precisely, they understood then that uh, the regulation of the global finance was not working. You could not uh, use the IMF to try to stabilize uh, global finance when you had a lot of countries going bankrupt simultaneously. So for a lot of colleagues, it was a kind of a waking shock. Paul Krugman, to just give you an example, uh, Paul Krugman first, sorry to huge uh, French words or a French expression, he had eaten his hat. Eaten his hat is an expression, a French expression to say um, you are to reverse your ideas to a large extent. And what Paul Krugman uh, did in 1998 was to admit that globalization and the way global finance was working uh, was not sustainable. Then you had the huge controversy between the World Bank, then laid by John St uh, Joseph Stiglitz, and the IMF. And during uh, this big fight, and I remember very well um, to have went uh, to the World Bank in Washington and was speaking well, uh, where are you going uh, after this meeting? Well, uh, I have to see people in the IMF. Oh, the IMF. Well, um, get out from the building, from this door, and not cross the door to go to the IMF. Uh, take a turn and go to the IMF by the other door uh, at the back of the, uh, of the building. Why? Well, you know, um, the situation is so tense between all two institutions that um, I'm not sure that uh, some lost shot uh, could not hit you when you will cross uh, the street. By the way, you, maybe you, uh, you don't know that. Uh, the IMF and uh, the World Bank are just in front of each other. <laughs> it was a, an extraordinarily tense um, situation. So the immediate factor of this crash were, of course, uh, a very bad fiscal base, collusion uh, and the development of a state debt, collusion uh, between some elements of the Russian state and uh, the oligarchs, and of course the problem of the change rate and unsustainable development. Um, all of that you have probably uh, read into uh, the document I sent you, you know, uh, the post-Soviet uh, economy uh, paper uh, written in 2002. But what is much more important were of course long-term factors. The first effect of that was to trigger uh, a kind of general review 
of the process of privatization. You know that the privatization and mostly the, the, the big privatization, the privatization of big enterprise, um, has given birth in Russia to the phenomenon of oligarchs. Uh, oligarchs were not born from nowhere. Uh, all oligarchs were the son or the daughter of high-ranking people in uh, the Communist Party. Gloops. Transfer. Oh, plenty of time. Plenty of time. <laughs> um, uh, they were uh, known colloquially as the sons of the nomenclatura. Gaida was a very good example. Uh, the father uh, of Yegor Gaida uh, was an admiral uh, in the Soviet fleet. His grandfather was uh, a pretty well-known author uh, for children. You ev we even won a Stalin Prize in 1951. So, Gaida, just to give you an example, was a perfect product of the Soviet nomenclature. And this could also apply to mostly uh, all uh, new oligarchs. So, if oligarchs have been able to, to stall, there is no other word, uh, this large enterprise, that have been with the support of the Russian government. And because of the crisis of 1998, and because of the understanding that one of the reasons of the crisis has been the kind of collusion between part of the states and the oligarchs, but also the behavior of these oligarchs, um, you had a kind of revision of the process uh, of privatization. Not uh, an open revision, but uh, when you look for the next 10 years, you know, the years going from 1998 to 2008 or 2010, you can see uh, a lot of oligarchs kick it out. Some of them even died. That could happen uh, when you are putting the stake so high uh, that you are, to some extent, challenging uh, the power of the state. Uh, and those oligarchs from pre-1998, which are still in charge of their enterprise, have made their peace with the Russian state, which, by the way, means that they made their peace with uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Because, to some extent, uh, when I am speaking of the Russian state, I'm, of, of course, uh, speaking of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Um, the second long-term factors was that uh, the Washington consensus uh, completely exploded in Russia. And people began to understand, first, the need to have strong institutions, not just the problem to have uh, a right uh, fiscal policies, but to have before strong institutions. And after that, to have a good economic policy, or at least an economic policy which would focus onto economic development. The 1998 uh, crashes was the end in Moscow of the Washington uh, consensus. The third factor, which is also very important, uh, it was also uh, the end of westernization of Russia. By westernization of Russia, I am describing a process where people in Western states, or sometimes people living in Russia, were seeing transition just as a process of 
making Russia a Western country. Be they good, be they bad, this process collapsed in 1998. The problem now is that for a lot of Western leaders, mostly but not only in the United States, uh, they have seen this collapse of the westernization of Russia as a kind first of personal affront to them, and the second point as uh, the making of an adverse Russia, or at least a Russia which will be adverse to Western states. And very frequently in international politics, uh, this kind of prophecy is a self-fulfilling one. Um, the problem was that in Russia began then a strive to regain its own sovereignty. Uh, this even gave birth to a number of theory and uh, one of the advisors of Vladimir Putin even coined the word of sovereign democracy. A sovereign democracy uh, is a concept um, which is quite interesting by the way. I'm not sure that it has been really used uh, into its uh, conceptual uh, relevance into Russia, but nevertheless, it has uh, its importance. Uh, the consequences of this crash were also three very important things. Uh, the first one was the destruction of Russian finance. Russian finance uh, were built by then mostly onto the trade of uh, state bonds, which are known uh, in Russian as uh, government bonds or GKO. The market for the GKO disappeared uh, instantly when the government says that it was no more acknowledging its own debt. But this market of GKOs was actually uh, the basis of all the development of Russian banks. So that's why, in 1998, nearly 90% of Russian banks collapsed. They did not collapse instantly because you, get, you got a kind of banking holiday, like the one implemented um, by Roosevelt uh, after in his introduction of power in January 1933. But nevertheless, after the banking holidays, we have seen the collapse of uh, nearly 90% of Russian banks. But a very interesting result was that no more the financial markets or the banking markets were able to attract uh, a large part of enterprise profits. The profits made by industrial enterprise were no more attracted by these markets. And to a very large extent, that helped the development of investment in Russia. Of course, investment was still constrained by the fact that uh, it was funded mostly uh, by the resource of uh, the company. But nevertheless, it was much better than to divest a large part uh, of benefits into these financial markets. The second very important point to understand is the fact that the huge depreciation of the currency, of the ruble, uh, and to just give you an example, um, in end June 1998, uh, the change rate was of 6.8 ruble for one US dollar. Uh, by the end of 1998, uh, it was nearly 20 ruble uh, for one US dollar, and it stabilized uh, in 1999 uh, uh, at uh, 30 
between 26 and 30 uh, rubles uh, for one US dollar. We had a massive depreciation, but this massive depreciation had two results, or more, three results actually. Result number one, imported goods uh, were no more competitive onto the Russian market. This gives birth to the development, the very fast development, of a lot of Russian enterprise, uh, specifically uh, working onto basic consumptions. Uh, you have a very, very good example that the development of uh, this, uh, this enterprise, this company, is um, producing yogurt um, and uh, all uh, other dairy products, uh, which is called Winbindan. Winbindan, no, this is not Russian. It's just Wimbledon uh, in Russian. And because the two founders <coughs> of, this, uh, of this company are, were, and are, see, because they are still alive, um, big tennis fan. So they decided in uh, 1996, 1997 to call their own enterprise Winbindan. Yeah. Winbindan, Wimbledon. <laughs> if you are looking uh, in Russia, you will see Win, Bin, Dan. That's Wimbledon. That, that's the way Wimbledon uh, is pronounced um, uh, uh, in Russia. This company uh, had its turnover uh, doubled from 1998 to 1999. And for the following five years, it doubled every year. No, this exponential development. Uh, you had also other companies which developed very, very fast. That's the first result. The second result was, of course, an increased competitiveness of Russian production onto foreign markets. Of course, Russia was not producing a lot of things to be exported, but commodities. Nevertheless, you had some Russian goods which were exported, uh, either uh, trucks or military systems. And this gave birth to a very important increase of these exportations. Both phenomena uh, revived the Russian economy very, very fast. And the third result is linked to commodity trade. When a Russian company is producing oil or gas or metals, also because uh, never forget that a huge part of commodities in the Russian trade balance is not oil and gas, it's also metals, uh, wood, things like that. Okay. But let me just talk about oil and gas. Look at the big uh, gas giant, uh, Gazprom. Gazprom is producing gas. In what currency is Gazprom paying its employees? In rubles. In what currency is Gazprom being paid for its exports in dollars. So any depreciation of rubles by comparison with the US dollar is decreasing the equivalent of cost of production in dollars. So is making Gazprom to make much greater profit in US dollars. And the result was that all the exporting companies have tremendously increased their profits, which enabled the Russian government to make them to pay taxes. And because of these taxes, 
all the budget, all the Russian budget could get balanced. Of course, it was not done in just one day. And remember uh, the big fight between the Russian government and Gazprom, which was technically a state-owned company, but which has been, by the way, become nearly independent by the way it was managed, um, the way the Russian government take back the control onto Gazprom, it was a bit dirty. <laughs> I, I was to, uh, to tell you. Uh, I remember uh, when the, uh, the Russian government uh, launched a big inquiry uh, onto the Gazprom management. Uh, at Gazprom headquarters uh, in Moscow, you got 300 policemen uh, with five armored vehicles uh, standing before uh, the big tower of Gazprom. And you had all the managers of Gazprom laying on the snow. It was in January. <laughs> you know, <laughs> with the arms <laughs> crossed like that, and with a policeman uh, with a gun onto the head. That was uh, kind of uh, taking back the control. Uh, of Gazprom. Uh, the lessons was not lost by other companies because if the, if the Russian government could do that to such a giant like Gazprom, <coughs> it can do that very, very well for us. So, okay, um, uh, we are to spontaneously come to the Russian government and tell him that the amount of or debt for taxes is to be paid in the next six months. It's extraordinarily uh, interesting to see the amount of money the Russian government got in the first six months after the crashes. <laughs> of course, it was not just the crashes uh, which give uh, give birth to this process. It was also the process of rebuilding the state. And this process is mostly linked uh, to the name of now uh, forgotten leaders, but if, which was by uh, the end of 1998 and the beginning of 1999 extremely important. It was the prime minister of this time, uh, Yevgeny Primakov. Uh, and to tell you the truth, uh, I have worked uh, for Yevgeny uh, Maximovich Primakov uh, at the end of uh, 1998, at the beginning of 1999, specifically uh, on to uh, preparing new legislations uh, to cut short um, the capital flight uh, then happening in Russia. So the so second point is, uh, from this crash, how Russia uh, went on to uh, an economic rebuilding, of course, a painful rebuilding, but nonetheless, a very effective economic rebuilding. From Primakov to the arrival of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, you had a very deep understanding uh, into uh, the Russian political elite that institutions were the main point of Russian economic development. Uh, we can find that Putin was probably more crude than Primakov was, but, sorry, it's beyond the point. What is important was that the work was done. And it's extremely important to understand that, first, uh, they put in place uh, property rights, real property rights. Of course, they didn't reverse all the privatization. There have been a debate. Uh, there have been a debate, and um, by September, October 2000, uh, I went to Moscow to discuss the possibility uh, of reversing a large part of privatization. I was at, actually, there was two positions. People saying, well, uh, and I, I was supporting these people. What is needed is uh, privatization 
2.0. That is, uh, annihilation of all the privatization done in a very sketchy and very messy way from 1993 to 1998, uh, concentration by the state, and then reprivatization. And you had people saying uh, it's impossible to, to do so without kind of a big problem uh, with Western countries, but it's much better uh, to stay with the current privatization system, but to have a huge file, huge political file and criminal file prepared for the responsible uh, of this enterprise. And every time they will step out from the government pattern, we will show to the justice the criminal file. What they did. The second problem was, of course, the re the, or more, it's linked to this one, was the return of the state. And it was absolutely obvious. The return of the state, which took the form uh, in Russia of um, re-establishing uh, what was called um, the hierarchical of power. This was not done uh, in a way understood uh, in Western countries because uh, still so far uh, the hierarchical uh, structure of power in Russia is still very lax because Russia is a federal state. And believe me, um, Vladimir Putin could be uh, as powerful as he is. He could have this huge support from the Russian population. He could not make s some change, some specific change, into the management of regions. He had to bargain with the regional elites. Of course, this bargaining is sometimes more easy than some others. But he has, in a general way, to bargain with um, the regional elite. But the big change before the pre-1998 uh, situation was the fact that right now, the regional elite understood that they had to bargain with uh, the federal government, with uh, Vladimir Putin. The second very important point were concerning um, social institutions. And uh, you got the development of what I have called uh, social authoritarianism. Uh, social authoritarianism <coughs> is uh, something which is uh, pretty important in Russian history because it existed already in the 18th uh, and the beginning of 19th century. And it was uh, pretty interesting to see Russia going back uh, to this situation. But nevertheless, the social dimension of this policy was extremely important. Uh, you got the social programs, the social federal programs, which are also called, uh, or they're also called uh, the presidential priorities. Education, uh, health, uh, and uh, the network of hospitals uh, in Russia, transportation, and uh, local development. These four points were priorities for the Russian government from 2001-2002 on up to the current situation. Uh, the third point important was also a policy of stabilizing and rebuilding uh, the industry and more precisely the mechanic industry uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, this had to some expect uh, the dimension of selling part of the Russian industry to foreign owners. Uh, in this rebuilding, just to give you an example, um, the federal government 
pick it up uh, the French company Renault and developed Renault, or more precisely, let Renault to develop in Russia uh, into a very effective way. Uh, after that, he picked it up Volkswagen, Audi, uh, Peugeot, P PSA, so far. But for all the uh, for the other branches or for other activities, um, the government then renationalized some enterprise and created huge concerns. Uh, and these concerns, uh, you know, were more or less shaped the way um, Korean, concern, con Korean concentration uh, of enterprise are made. And that's the beginning of something which, which was to become uh, much more important uh, after 2008. This is the kind of thinking the Chinese way or thinking the Asian way into uh, the Russian elites. Uh, one man is extraordinarily um, representative of uh, this kind of understanding. This is uh, Ivan Sechin. Ivan Sechin is now the main owner and the main director of the huge oil sorry yeah is the owner uh, of this huge oil company uh, named Rosneft Rosneft was built uh, from the rubles uh, of the Yukos companies. When Yukos got dismantled and its owner uh, went into jail uh, in 2003, the Russian government uh, developed from Yukos this huge uh, uh, state company. And now Rosneft is probably the most important oil company in the world. It's greater uh, than BP, uh, greater than Exxon, greater than all other companies. Uh, the last point uh, into these priorities was, of course, uh, the development of a kind of law and order situation. Uh, law and order, uh, th th that was something uh, really asked for uh, by the Russian population because first, uh, the government had to tame organized crime, an organized crime which was extremely important in the 90s in Russia, went down onto manageable uh, dimension. I'm not to, uh, to tell you that there are no more organized crime in Russia, certainly. Uh, and you have quite certainly heard about some problems, you know, sometimes you have a big explosion in one of the uh, quite important markets uh, of Moscow city. And so th largely this kind of explosion, this kind of terrorist act are not linked with the Chechens, uh, with anything uh, we know here uh, in Western Europe. This is the result of some fights between uh, separate groups of the Russian organized crime community. But nevertheless, now the situation is much more manageable than it was uh, in the 90s. And the third uh, important fact uh, devised by Primakov uh, and then by Putin was the inclusion of Russia into the global economy. Uh, this inclusion uh, was developed mostly uh, to be able to compete uh, for technology onto the same level than uh, Western companies. And to develop this inclusion, the Russian government uh, tried to develop a Russian company of a global size. Uh, it was successful uh, in the commodity sector. Now, the large Russian companies 
uh, are more or less globalized. Um, in the non-community sector, uh, this has been much more difficult, but still we have right now very huge companies uh, which are uh, operating uh, onto the global economy. But in the same time that the Putin government was pushing these very large companies to go global, uh, in the same time began a process of estrangement between Russia and the Western world. Uh, and this process uh, began very, very obviously by 2006 and 2007. Uh, remember the very famous speech delivered in Munich uh, in 2007 uh, by Vladimir Putin. If you want to understand all the Russian diplomacy since 2007, you have a very good guideline. Look at his speech. What tell uh, Putin? He tell that having one country trying to impose its own norm, legal system, onto other countries was not to be tolerated. It was not openly speaking of the United States, but it was very clear to all people uh, who attended his speech that he was describing the United States. And what he tells was, either we can agree for the rebuilding of a common frame of international rights, but to do that, it's extremely important that the United States stop to act in an unilateral and unlawful way. Or, if we are not able to reach this point, then we will create with other countries a separate system of international rights. This is exactly what happened. Uh, now, you have a growing alliance uh, of China, Russia, Iran, but also India and other countries coming more and more, not just because they are loving each other, don't, you know, uh, don't make any mistake uh, on this one. Um, India is at a cutthroat situation with Pakistan. Uh, the situation between Russia and China is formally good, but these two countries uh, are <coughs> quite in a competition uh, in Africa. So it is not a kind of love affairs between these countries, but it is the understanding that all these countries, which are, by the way, uh, representing uh, uh, 66 or 70 percent of the world population, uh, are to make, are to have a kind of united front against the United States. So it's extremely important to, to understand that on the one hand, uh, Russia was pushing its large enterprise into the globalized economy. On the other hand, it was organizing uh, itself and organizing an alliance around of Russia uh, to break the global world. Okay. I'm stopping uh, now, and after that, uh, I will uh, develop other problems as an answer to your questions. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the usefulness of economic history because uh, Jacques Sapir did a lot of. Uh, uh, economic history, and I think it's very interesting. And uh, well, the ruptures and continuity in Russian economy since uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Soviet Union. Then uh, Alina is going to make an overview of the major difficulties that uh, the Russian economy has faced uh, since the transition period. And eventually, Babur is going to talk about the monetary policy of Russia since 2004. 
So first of all, why is history, uh, economic history so useful and interesting? And I think it's the only way to go beyond the, um, like the dichotomy we can have, have between uh, archaism and uh, modernity. There are some good institutions and bad institutions. And actually, um, every change always relies on the previous institution because you cannot have like a real um, revolution in the institution because economic agents actually cannot like just change basically institution. So a more interesting question that you can only deal with um, economic history is um, well to what extent the pre-existing institution are useful tools or um, hampers the changes in institution. And I think Russia is a perfect example to study that because you basically had two real revolutions with the Soviet revolution and then the liberal revolution in the 19. And what you say actually is that m you might have some revolution in the economic and uh, political landscape, but when you look at the uh, mo financial and monetary situation, you have this persisting instability and um, in the monetary and financial system during the whole period. And you can see that in two ways. So you have monetary instability and a really weak credit development. And it's pretty interesting because, well, both of them are, of course, connected because they're linked to the lack during the liberal period and the absence during the Soviet period of credit intermediation. Uh, and it, it is due to the divide, like, Similar situation in the starry, uh, Tsarist Russia and ap during starvation. It's due like to the um, divide in the banking sector between large companies, uh, large banking, uh, large banks that have access to the um, central bank funding and all the small and uh, small credit enterprise that actually don't have any fundings from the central bank. And so you have this weak credit development. And you also have the central banks, which is a major um, refine a major source of banking refinancing that only select uh, like few sector to fund. So you have a w like all the small and medium enterprise that have no access to credit, and that lead to two major things: is like uh, a lot of the development of a parallel monetary practices with intercompany credits and all this kind of stuff, and a regular liquid liquidity crisis. In so in both case, and why do we have that? And I think that's a, an also very interesting thing with um, economic history that actually can reveal some flow in the economic theory. Basically, well, I'm going to talk about the neutrality of money, which I mean, we all know that is is obvious, obviously flawed, but. In the liberal Russia, it makes sense that they have this problem. But in the Soviet Union, it's very interesting because you see that they have the same problem. They kind of believe in the neutrality of money, even though in a different way. Because the all the prices are fixed. But actually, the um, Russian authorities, the Soviet authorities, still kept the money as a um, unit of accounts because, I mean, you cannot just destroy money. It's like some kind of social institution that is really hard. But they tried to, well, they fixed all the price, and then the um, funding, they funded the, um, um, the companies through, um, well, budget allocation and through credits. And what you see here, so I'm just like, this is the agricultural sector and this is the building sector. And you see that, so under, it's in French, but on the horizontal axis, axis you have the rate of growth of employment. And you here you have the rate of growth of the um, wage. And what you see is actually it didn't follow the plan at all. I mean, companies still have power on the setting of, of wages. And, well, if you're post Canadian, you understand that after they had sort of like inflation crisis. And, I mean, what you see here, actually some sector could get some additional credits uh, beside the, all the budget allocation that were kind of like not en not sufficient to uh, fund the economy and their cost and to recover the cost. And so you have this real instability during the world period, considering some uh, sectors that had access to credit and some others that didn't. And another problem that they had is that actually the pay the all the sectors that had access to additional credits kind of 
translated into higher wage and that give rise to like all the grey economy, so called, with the illegal sector that where all the circulation of money got just got out of hand of the um, legal authorities. And that actually go back to the triangle, he said, because, well, he said that, uh, Jack Sapir said that they didn't have economic rights in the Soviet Union, and that may be true. But with that, you see that we also had a real problem with the legitimacy, because, m I mean, the money is one of the bedrock of, a social, of social cohesion and of a society. And what you see here is actually, well, the state didn't have any control on the money circulation because you have intercompany credits and, well, since they didn't have enough funds to finance, to cover the cost and to produce, well, they had to find some other way and so that undermined the, the authority of the state. And eventually, it's just like a small graph to that could be used for both the Soviet Union and the... Um, and and the liberal Russia with some kind of difference, but you both have like a restrictive monetary policy and a lack of credit intermediation that lead to, that lead to credit rationing. And you have, so I think the more interesting stuff are an intervention of the central bank uh, with expansionist policy to legitimize. So you have the problem of legitimacy in both cases. And you also have like, a lot of illiquidity and payment crisis due to the lack of intermediation. And that also shows that they were also had a problem of cooperation between the sector because all the profits that were made in the unwritten sector were not, didn't lead to any endogenous growth in Russia. So, okay. so that's going to be all for me, but I'm going to leave the room <laughs> to Alina, who's going to talk about like more after the Soviet Union. So now we want to talk a bit about problems and challenges uh, for Russian economy. So many of them, they emerged from uh, 90s from privatization as a result of lack of privatization, of lack of a very important institution. First, as it was already mentioned, is a rise in corruption. So an emerging of oligarchs, which are still like business and economical elite, and it's believed to be like a billionaire in Russia. Now you don't have to be like smart, you don't have to have like, great ideas, you need to get the support from the government. And now people, now people who own the most lucrative business in Russia, many of them they are friends of uh, Vladimir Putin, friends from university, friends from childhood, friends from uh, uh, secondary school. And for example, Deripaska, Gref, mm -hmm. uh, Mikhail Friedman. Uh, also, it's as I said before, like it was very unfair, and now people complain a lot about this and about this privatization. And really, we want to do privatization. Some people want to do privatization again. And also, it was mentioned like criminalization. So this was uh, like 90s. There was the time of uh, extortion rocket, protection rocket, and some formal institutions we weren't created to protect business. So in 90s, 85 percent of all the business were covered, were protected by criminals groups, by Russian mafia. And also, this is how new Russian emerged. New Russian were people who achieved rapid wealth by using illegal methods. And these people are still like rich, still in business. And, each, uh, and this uh, explains why now in Russia, like the culture of business, the business etiquette is not very high. And businessmen very easily uh, neglect the rules and the laws. And also, like 90s uh, and privatization, it's really damaged the in, uh, reputation of Russia. And Russia started to be associated with like kleptocracy and with a very criminal state, with banditism and so on. And also, another big uh, problem for Russia is capital outflow. And it started in uh, 1994. And during the whole history, there were only two years without capital, capital outflow, like 2006, 2007. But when it was followed by a crisis in, 2000, in 2008, and after Ukrainian conflict, actually, the uh, volume of capital at floor was the highest. It was more than 150 uh, billion of dollars. And uh, next problem is uh, problem is aggressive uh, foreign policy of Russia, which leads to isolation of Russia and sanctions. So here you can see the map of the countries who impose sanctions uh, for uh, against Russia. And uh, current sanction sanctions which uh, will last till February 2019. And after we probably most likely we will prolong it for a longer period of time. And so this uh, was very detrimental for Russia, uh, for like, uh, ra uh, like ruble for Russian car currency, for capital outflow, and also Russia had to 
lead run the import substitution policy and also like did some uh, contrast action like for example food uh, embargo like uh, also it was mentioned before that Russia rely too much on natural resources and mostly on oil and gas so but here you can see uh, like the share of oil and gas export so in 2017 compared to 2013 it's actually decreased it actually decreased but it's still very high and even like more precisely is the dependency on oil like which started in uh, 1917 because uh, government wanted to get some dollars to use with dollars to buy some products which we couldn't produce in the USSR which people couldn't produce in the USSR and uh, then uh, like extortion of oil decreased but after 2000 uh, they started to extort more and more every year you know, some current uh, problems which are based on global competitiveness uh, report. So uh, uh, index for uh, this index for Russia is 4.5 out of 7. Out of and uh, the biggest problems uh, for Russia, which, is, which is, are like financial markets, institutions, business sophistication, innovations. And uh, uh, for like financial market development, the biggest problem is venture capital availability. So it's not that easy to Russia, like to get access to venture capital, when uh, like a business sophistication, business and business innovation, and you can see here factors which represent this, and uh, like one of the biggest problems is problems of uh, institutions in Russia, institutional framework, like steel is very weak, and uh, you can see that like the biggest problems for this is uh, like favoritism uh, in uh, decision of government uh, by uh, for government official, wastefulness of government spending, and burden uh, of government regulations. Uh, so we saw the like, current problems, and now we want to talk about monetary policy. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll present uh, the part of the evolution of monetary policy of Russia starting from 2004, because from 2004 and up to now, the changes in monetary policy of Russia were very interesting. So we start by analyzing the impossible, impossible trinity, and uh, if you know, as you know, the state cannot achieve three goals at the same time. And uh, from 2004 uh, till 2000, uh, just moment, seven, uh, Central Bank of Russia was following this kind of policy, and uh, we could see the connection between uh, fixed exchange rate managed exchange rate and uh, free capital flows position. So in, in that period, uh, the, uh, the CB was not following independent monetary policy, so it was not targeting inflation instead. It was looking at other variables. So uh, during this time, oil prices were going up from $20, $30 per barrel to 140 So, And it caused like the symptoms of Dutch disease. And the uh, ruble was appreciating very much, so th the government decided to uh, um, battle this and uh, started to buy foreign exchange from exporters and uh, uh, w was flooding the market with rubles and it caused uh, inflation to go up. But from 2007, when the crisis hit the Russia also, Central Bank of Russia changed the monetary policy uh, toward this uh, orientation and decided to move was inflation targeting position. So it was uh, the period of 2008 to 2014. And in this time, the Central Bank of Russia decided to target price stability as its primary goal and was using interest rates more often. Why this area is larger than the previous one is because uh, from 2008 to 2012, Russia was still trying to also keep a hand on the foreign exchange of Russian ruble. But it gave up after 2014 because of the sanctions and also the uh, falling, plummeting oil prices. So it couldn't battle against it. So as you can see from 2004 to 2014, CP was not following uh, the third option. If you look at the uh, <coughs> key interest rate of the central bank, uh, we can see that from 2004 to 2007, it was basically flat. So it, uh, CB was not changing it and was actively focusing on the ex uh, foreign exchange rate of the Russian ruble. But when the uh, financial economic meltdown hit the economy, 
it started to increase the key interest rate, and it's the benchmark one week repo rate. But you can see that it will it will be a little different. Like the color of this period is pink, while from 2014 is red, mostly because still, as I said, Russian economy, uh, Russian central bank was trying also to keep a hand on foreign exchange rate, and after 2013 it barely focused on inflation targeting. You can see also the dynamics of inflation and uh, inflation uh, targets by CB, and uh, you can see the discrepancies. Here, like two lines, show the uh, band which was acceptable by the central bank of the inflation target, and after 2014, it just said like flat one level. It didn't have any kind of band. So you can see here, inflation was rising while the oil prices were also going up because uh, Russia tried to accumulate a lot of foreign reserves and uh, it tried to devalue the Russian ruble. Later on, when the crisis hit, the inflation jumped up because uh, now Russian CP wanted to uh, help Russian ruble and uh, was also uh, trying to solve the macroeconomic problems. And from 2014, you can see a sharp increase in inflation and a lot of problems for the CP. So. We can also see the dynamics of uh, foreign exchange reserves. These are international reserves of Russia, not including gold. So you can see the very sharp increase from $100 billion to almost $600 billion in just uh, four or five years. And then you can see the sharp decline because of uh, financial crisis. And then again, another one in 2014 because of imposition of Western sanctions and the uh, Russian Central Bank trying to uh, watch the domestic currency market with a lot of uh, foreign exchange reserves, but it didn't help and it gave up on this and uh, decided to make uh, the floating exchange regime. So we can see that monetary policy of the Bank of Russia in 1990s and early 2000s, 2000s uh, can be described by quantity based McCollum type rule. It's different from Taylor rule, and uh, the Taylor rule can be applied uh, to the period from 2004 till now. It's the, these are offers uh, from Bank of Finland 2017 report. So exchange rate target was formally abandoned in November 2014, and the full-fledged inflation targeting was officially introduced in the beginning of 2015. So, so we can see that nowadays Bank of Russia uh, wants to target annual inflation rate at 4% and close to it and tries to achieve it. And it has been quite successful in this area. But if you, s if you look at uh, the triangle again and uh, you can answer why Russia didn't choose the third option, why it didn't want to impose capital controls instead of letting like, free capital flow in the economy and uh, battling inflation with interest rates. In for this, <laughs> we can... Uh, find the answer, going to Ireland. Uh, now we will focus on the FDI of the country. But you can f think why we have come here. This is British Virgin Islands. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's an offshore area. So the answer is here probably. <laughs> so offshore orientation of Russian FDI uh, can be explained by two, uh, two ways. Why? FDI of Russia was uh, oriented to offshore areas. You can uh, find the first additional explanation is tax ev evasion motives. Of course, uh, offshore allows like companies to evade the taxes, and uh, also non-traditional because you can see like these were given by Bulatov, and they say three reasons are insufficient safeguards for legal businesses, poor levels of financial market development, and high incidence of monopolization. So when Russian companies want to have capital for the investment, it's relatively hard for them to uh, fight against the monopolies in the economy and also have access to reserves because the Russian banks don't have a well developed financial market. So, and also the third reason, as I think, and also pointed by Financial Times, is to evade sanctions. That's why FDI of Russia is relatively focused on offshore. And you may say, uh, what are the 
key investors of FDI into Russia. So the answer is here. I accessed the Bank of Russia's official website and looked at FDI inflow and outflow stocks. And I could find that in 2018, the geographical location of FDI stock uh, was by Cyprus, Netherlands, British Virgin Islands, and Luxembourg as the biggest like countries with the stock of inflow and outflow of FDI. And top foreign investors in the Russian economy, Cyprus, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, the Bahamas, and the Bermuda. Netherlands and Luxembourg, not too offshore, but they are uh, areas that allow uh, relatively uh, flexible rules for sending your money to offshore territories. So, And the key destinations of Russian overseas FDI, also Cyprus, Netherlands, British Virgin Islands, and Austria. So that's why I decided to call this Russian capital merry-go-round. So, so, and the finally, we have made like two questions, basically for Professor Sapir. Uh, first is, has the central old monetary and credit instability of Russia been taken into account by the government? And uh, is the political system set by President Putin sustainable? And the second one is, more related to monetary policy, how feasible is it for Russia to impose capital controls and hence follow the third policy option of the trilemma, especially under the current Western sanctions? So this is the end of our part. Thank you very much. And now we'll invite Professor Safir for discussion until five o'clock. You can answer the uh, you can ask the questions. Yeah. Yes. yes, of course, certainly. Okay. Uh, first, um, let me tell you that uh, it is not just a century old uh, monetary and credit instability in Russia. Uh, there was, uh, to, to my understanding, um, uh, a slight mistake you made uh, in your uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Um, under the uh, under the service rule, there was no monetary instability. There was a banking instability, but no monetary instability. Actually, um, uh, the ruble was at first uh, under a, a silver standard then moving to the twin standard silver and gold, and then moving to gold. Um, there was a, a real instability in banks, or more precisely, uh, you had small banks uh, which made, well, which was living their own life, and then you have a small number of very, very large banks which were highly dependent, not of the central bank, of the state. Of course, the central bank was in the end of the state, but it was the Ministry of Finance uh, which established the real link. So the idea of a century-old monetary and credit instability is not exactly true. Um, now, the problem uh, in Russia, of course, is uh, the size of capital outflow. But it's not necessarily uh, a problem per se. Uh, is there is a very big change between uh, the nature of capital outflow uh, in the 90s and capital outflow now. Um, capital outflow in the 90s was mostly illegal uh, capital outflow, or more precisely, a capital outflow which was linked to tax evasion uh, and things like that. Now, you have also uh, investment made by huge Russian companies uh, in the foreign world. And uh, you have to uh, make a clear-cut separation uh, between them. Of course, it's quite difficult to do. Uh, I've tried many times. Um, a lot of my students are still trying to do so uh, because there is quite, uh, quite a few information only uh, on uh, uh, Russian investment uh, in the f Western or in the world globally, uh, not just Western. Um, you know that there is very, very few information about uh, how much uh, were costing South African companies bought uh, by Russian companies uh, 10 years ago. 
uh, and they are still uh, buying new and new um, South African companies right now. So in the uh, 150 billion dollars of uh, 2014, at least at least uh, 60 or 70 billion of dollars was linked to uh, the buying of uh, foreign companies. And this uh, situation was not existing uh, in the 90s. So uh, outflow now is not exactly comparable uh, to outflow uh, in the 90s. It's very, very important uh, to understand that. Still, you have uh, at least a very, very strong link between uh, Russian finance, or more precisely, the Russian uh, large banks and large enterprise with the global finance. And yes, uh, this is a problem. Um, there is a first a problem because when doing so, um, Russian uh, bank and enterprise are mostly using the US dollar. And because of that, uh, they could be vulnerable uh, to US sanctions. Uh, this is a problem, and this is explaining why, uh, for the last three years, um, the Russian stock exchange tried to develop uh, a market for yuan, for the ruble yuan uh, chain exchange, uh, and yes, it developed it. Um, the level of transaction increased uh, very, very quickly, but it is still uh, not enough to, I would say, uh, convince uh, other Russian operators uh, to change uh, their habits of using the US dollars and to move uh, to the UN. Okay? This is certainly one of the weakness um, of uh, the Russian finance. Um, this weakness is also linked to the undevelopment of uh, the Russian financial market and of uh, not just Russian finance, but as a different kind of market or non-market institution which could exist uh, on this point. Um, it's extremely important also to, to understand that. Uh, so far, there is still not a true inter-banking market in Russia. Uh, banks are in a relation straight with the central bank and they are not using the kind of uh, interbanking markets, just using the central banks to fund uh, either the, ex the, the excess or the deficit uh, of these markets. Why? That's because there is no confidence between the large banks, uh, between each other. And so far, uh, you know, uh, never um, the bank owned by Rosneft or the bank owned by Gazprom, which are two of the very, very large banks uh, in Russia, uh, will cooperate each other. This absence of a true interbanking system is certainly one of uh, the most crucial uh, institutions lacking in Russia. The second point is the fact that uh, there is very few instruments to develop this kind of markets. Uh, look back to the French history. Why the French government uh, wrote the 1973 uh, law uh, forbidding zero interest rates credits by the Bank de France <coughs> to uh, the French budget. Do you know why? Because this law is very, very frequently referred about on the internet as a uh, as a Rothschild law. Uh, well, okay, there is a lot uh, of uh, urban uh, theories about that, but there is a very, very simple reason, which was explained to us as uh, students 
uh, in the Sciences Po in 1972, 1973, uh, by the then head of the Treasury Department uh, of uh, the French government. And he told us, uh, we are introducing this law not to forbid uh, the funding of the budget deficit by the Bank de France, but to foster a market for uh, French bonds. And we have to sell enough of French bonds to banks so they could use them as an instrument for developing the intra-bank market. Okay. Now, look at the problem in Russia. What is the level of the internal uh, state debt in Russia? More or less 10% of GDP. You see the problem? There is no enough uh, bonds to make this market viable. So there is both a reluctance of huge banks to cooperate, this is absolutely true, but there is also a lack of instrument. And because of that, either uh, you need to have direct or indirect funding by the government, right now uh, more or less than 30 persons of, of all investment credits are done in Russia on subsidized credits. Uh, when you had this very high, this punitive uh, high rates in Russia in 2014, 2015, 2016, you have seen the graph. So at one time, um, the interest rates or the repo rates um, by uh, the central banks was at 12% or something like that. By this time, uh, if you were into the subsidized credit system, you could get credits at 3.5%. Okay? So, on one hand, you will have this huge dependence with the state, which is both a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it, ena it enabled the development of some specific investment uh, Russia needed. It's a bad thing because it is opening the, uh, the door for a lot of non-economic pressure, of political pressure onto Russian enterprise. And on the other end, the only way for big Russian enterprise to get credits is to go onto the foreign market. Yeah, okay. So then we could understand the problem number two. Why uh, the Russian Central Bank did not impose uh, a form of capital control? Well, actually, I have been advocating that uh, since uh, 2007. Uh, you know, in 2008, in January 2008, uh, there was a huge forum in Moscow organized by a uh, then quite important uh, Russian bank uh, about uh, the looming crisis uh, uh, in the Western world, uh, the fact that uh, Russia was uh, by then called a safe even uh, for credit, blah, 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 blah. And Kudrin, which was then the Ministry uh, of Finance, came to the forum and he delivered us a speech of 30 minutes uh, um, boasting this situation, well, that's absolutely perfect. Uh, uh, Moscow will be uh, the safe house for uh, a lot of uh, foreign capital, blah, 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 blah. And I was a discutant uh, of Kudrin. And I said, uh, Mr. Kudrin, uh, you are deeply and badly wrong. Because by doing so, what you would foster? You would foster the entrance in Russia of hot capital, of very, very short-term capital. And this capital is able to get out from Russia 
quasi instantly if there is any any uh, fear of a problem in Russia. So what your dream will bring to Russia is just financial instability. We had a pretty odd discussion um, after that. But it's exactly what happened uh, when you had the Lehman Brothers cr uh, crash and then because a lot of investment funds had uh, to fund the losses suffered in the crisis in Wall Street, they bring back uh, the money uh, from Moscow. Nevertheless, it is because of this kind of mentality that the Russian Central Bank has refused uh, to impose any uh, capital control and is still refusing to impose it. And uh, I had in 2013 a, a discussion with President Putin on that in the Valdai Club. Uh, in the Valdai Club, some participants of the Valdai Club have the possibility uh, to see President Putin and to uh, ask him some questions. And to Putin also to ask us uh, some questions. President Putin came and he asked me if I was believing that the ruble as a future as a kind of regional reserve currency. I said to him no, for just one reason, not enough debt of Russia. Uh, you know that to have uh, a currency used as a reserve currency, be it at a global or at a regional level, you need to have foreign central banks owning a title of debt of your country. With, by then, I think uh, uh, the Russian debt was 9% uh, of GDP. There was absolutely not enough instruments to do so. So I, I tell them, either you are to increase uh, the debt to 25%, and then maybe you could do so. I said, no, 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 never, okay? And if you are not doing so, uh, the ruble will never be a kind of reserve, regional reserve currency. But then I asked him, uh, why have you not introduced capital control in 2008, uh, 2009, when there were the huge uh, financial crash uh, in the West? And what he told me was very interesting. He said, yes, we couldn't have done so. But first, it was not necessary because we had enough central bank reserves to cover uh, the capital flight. And that's true, they had uh, uh, 600 billion uh, dollars. The capital flight uh, made the reserve uh, to decrease by one third, <coughs> but with the four, uh, um, 400 billion dollars, they still have more than enough. Okay. And the second point, it was quite interesting. He told me um, the fact that the Russian central bank or the Russian government was to introduce a kind of capital control will be seen in the West as a kind of rupture, of economic rupture between Russia and the West. That's interesting because it proves that still now part of the Russian economic policy is linked to the image of Russia in the West. Or, more precisely, the way the Russian elite is representing the image of Russia in the West. Point one. Point two. Uh, the Russian government is still extremely, extraordinarily cautious about uh, making any of its move interpreted as a kind of break, of definitive break with the West. Which, by the way, is giving you a picture extremely different of the picture you could have reading the Western media. In the Western media, 
it's all about, well, uh, Putin is acting unilaterally, um, it is very uh, against the West, and so and so. The truth is that the Russian government is extraordinarily cautious not to worsen the situation between him and the West. Okay. Of course that could change. Just but maybe like they probably uh, have many questions. Yes. So okay. I think we should just like okay. try to listen okay. to the okay. question and you will have very time. Yeah, it's very interesting, but I, I think so. Okay, so okay. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. So if people have questions, just raise your hand. Um, <coughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, we're gonna, like, we're gonna have three questions and then you can answer simultaneously. So, Juan, uh, Mateus, okay. Only one question? No, there is. Uh, and don't forget to introduce yourself yeah. and say where you come from. Okay, because our guests will be uh, I'm Ron, uh, originally from uh, Ukraine, now Israel. And yeah, I just want to ask you about the very last thing you said, that the Russian elite is very cautious about not to make the relationship with the West uh, worse. But I think the Russian elite did so many mistakes in, in this area in, in the last maybe 10 years. I mean, I'm speaking about wars and I'm speaking about invasion into Syria and, and a lot of things. So, I mean, how cautious they are. They are conscious of that, but in a Russian way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and, 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 and what I'm saying is, is not a joke. Um, uh, the Russian elite is seeing the country as surrounded, at least on the Western part, by uh, countries which are wanting to uh, destroy Russia. That's because there is the memories of the 90s and what the West has done in Russia, uh, uh, meddling with Russian election many times, uh, operating military troops on the Russian territory without any warning. You know that uh, the Russian army has captured in Chechnya several CIA operators. So this is known by the Russian elite. And uh, the result is that the Russian elite is saying some Western countries, NATO, United States, as uh, huge enemies of Russia. You could uh, call that a paranoid vision of the world. But beware, even the paranoid have true enemies. So, um, the different actions taken by the Russian government, as harsh as you can see them. Um, let me tell about the war uh, of Southern Ossetia uh, with Georgia. It was for Russia a reaction to what uh, they perceived as an attack. The fact that Georgian troops have bombed the city of Tsingvali without a warning. And this triggered, of course, a response by the Russian government. And what they are saying is that their response was very cautious. They didn't invade World Georgia. They destroyed Georgian troops engaged in the fighting, but stop and then. Okay? Uh, this is the same thing uh, with the problem of Ukraine. With Ukraine, uh, when the Soviet Union exploded in 1991, there was a kind of understatement and there was a, a kind of agreement between Yeltsin and Ukrainian leaders, which was Yeltsin was agreeing uh, ab about the independence of Ukraine in its then territorial form, which was to some extent a product of administrative division of the country under the Soviet Union and not the historical Ukraine. But 
as a return, uh, the Ukrainian government agreed that never it would put into question the use of the Russian language in eastern part of Ukraine. That's exactly what the government coming from the Maidan uh, insurrection did uh, early in 2014. And it triggered instantly a response by Russia. Yes, yes, I know, I know, I know, but if you are looking about the law taken by the Rada, they wanted to uh, stop the learning of Russian in the country. And there was a, a, an instant reaction on that. Uh, you have to understand one thing, that is, the Russian elite, bad or good, it, it's not the problem is still extremely, uh, well, both cautious and extremely uh, firm, extremely strong on one point. This is uh, agreements are to be respected. And they got a story of nearly, nearly 20 years of agreement not respected, by Western countries. So this fostered a huge feeling, a feeling which is shared not just by Putin and people around him, but now by the global Russian elite that they are uh, under attack by the West. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. Um, my name is Mateus. I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics. I come from Brazil, one country that, uh, as Russia, uh, started one organization called BRICS, one organization that started with one of main aims being uh, to be a counterbalance on ge geopolitical power, counterbalance especially for the power of the old rich countries, especially US. And although this initial aim, in the last years, uh, the BRICS have seen each more, at least from our st uh, point of view, uh, basically a tool for, instead of counterbalancing, having China as a replacing of the imperial power, which is basically uh, exploiting and robbing the other countries. So I would like to ask you, what's your vision about the position of Russia into BRICS, if you believe in this substitution of the imperial power or any other thing? How, how you see it, basically? Well, uh, Wait, can you just collect the question? Okay. Arnaud, so. and then we, and then you can answer all those mm -hmm. questions. Uh, hello, my name is Arnaud. I'm in option B, uh, financial regulation. I'm from Quebec in Canada. Uh, my question is about what you were talking about, um, Russia, counterbalancing this the US uh, monopoly and I was wondering in what way is it about like or maybe uh, opposing uh, yes US monopoly of uh, and of what that is my question is it about human right is it about a way to conduct a global economy or is it just a, a logic capitalist uh, economic fight you know what I mean so I was wondering this this rivalry is this on yeah. what stand on what uh, aspects? So the first point, um, uh, BRICS uh, is an institution seen by the Russian elite uh, as a way of managing future relations between them and China. Uh, the Russian elite and huge part of the Russian population is understanding that um, they ought to be married uh, with Russia uh, with uh, China for the next 20 or 30 years. But, in the same time, they understand that relations with China are not to be simple. First, because China is much more powerful now than Russia on economic factors, not on military factors, but on economic factors. So they need a kind of institutional framework to manage their difference 
and to achieve a kind of coordination with the Chinese policy. This is exactly what BRICS is about. And by the way, a lot of countries are uh, bring into uh, the BRICS uh, framework for exactly the same reason. How to manage their relation with China that they are seeing more and more as a substitute to the US influence. That's the problem of uh, India. Uh, it's also the problem uh, of Iran. Okay, yes. So, uh, BRICS is not to be the kind of uh, uh, economic alliance uh, that we are supposed to have uh, with uh, the European Union. But it's an institution, uh, div you know, uh, which is designed to enable countries with both difference, but also with a common interest, to manage their difference. No less, no more. That's the first point. Then, uh, about the project uh, of uh, the Russian elite. Uh, the competition with uh, United States is, at the very least, uh, on three different points. The first point is, of course, uh, Russia wants to see its own national interest preserved. This is absolutely clear. And the problem was that uh, for maybe 10 years, the United States didn't acknowledge uh, national, uh, Russian national interest. What is the national interest? National interest, be they economic, be they geopolitical, uh, there are a, a, a number of points which are to be called national interest. But I can tell you, to having participated to different and regular meetings uh, from the 90s until the beginning of the 2000s, both with uh, people from the Russian government and people from the US government, that it took at least 10 years for the US government to understand that uh, there are some things he could not do regarding to Russia. Because uh, by the mid-90s, the US government was thinking he could do everything he wanted toward Russia. And this, of course, uh, triggered a response. That's the first point. The second point is the fact that Russia is now seeing, globally speaking, uh, Asia, East Asia, uh, more, preci more precisely, as the real uh, tug of economic growth for the years to come. So he want to establish good relations with uh, countries of East Asia. And to do so, uh, Russia has no other option than to get an agreement with China. The problem is that now uh, China is at stake with the United States. And it was quite foreseeable, by the way. But the main thing is the fact that uh, both on economic reasons and on geopolitical reasons, uh, Russia is now more and more thinking that its development will be linked with the development of East Asia. Uh, it's particularly true uh, for the development of uh, oil and gas. More and more uh, oil and gas are to be exported to China and to uh, other Asian countries. Uh, and probably uh, Russia will accept a decrease of its export uh, toward Europe. That's the point two. The point three is more ideological. Uh, the Russian elite is hoping to restore a kind of uh, international uh, law framework in the world after the destruction of this framework by the United States from the late 90s till the early 2000s. Uh, 
look at what happened on the Kosovo. Uh, on the Kosovo, uh, the United States and other Western countries just broke uh, the UNO charter about independence. So there is a lot of other examples where international law has not been respected either by the United States or by the United States and some of the Western countries inside NATO. The main, top, the, the main point for the Russian elite, and again, I am telling you how the Russian elite is thinking. I am not saying that I think uh, the same thing. Okay? But the main point for the Russian elite is to achieve a kind of agreement global agreement with the United States, restoring a kind of international law. But to do so, they think that they have to act from a position of power. And the only position of power they can have is by siding with China again. So you have to understand the mix of these three factors as shipping uh, the view, the global view uh, of the United States of, and of international relation uh, in Russia. We had uh, on Monday, on Monday and Tuesday, a big meeting in Moscow organized by the UNESCO and uh, the Russian Academy of Science about science for peace. It's a huge forum, you know, with uh, more than uh, 140 NGO coming. Okay, I was part of three panels. These three panels were dedicated onto the problem of international security. And on these three panels, uh, the Russian uh, people made extremely clear that, first, uh, they wanted to obtain from the United States some form of restraint of the US policy. And the second point that if to do so, they had to go to a new Cold War, they were ready to do so. I just hope that US people who are part of the panel were of a high influence enough to talk the message back to the United States because it was very clearly stated. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sapir. I'm Louis. Uh, I'm French and from option B. To, um, I have two questions, actually. So the first one is quite related to what you uh, to just mentioned, which, I mean, which quite puzzled me in the sense that the U.S. is now more or less abandoning its role as the, the hegemon, actually, on the international you know, stage. So how does Russia welcome this move on the part of Donald Trump, namely, and be it on, you know, on the military or economic uh, aspects. And second, it's more related to uh, the future of uh, Russian exports, which still rely quite a lot on oil. What about all the, you know, the changes in favor of green economies in the West, for instance, here in Europe, regarding oil, uh, oil imports and gas also imports from Russia uh, in this respect? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh Oh, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> I'm Jan from, from Option A, that's Innovation and Knowledge Policies. I'm from Argentina. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, uh, presentation, you said about uh, the institutional development for achieving macroeconomic policies, like ma macroeconomic success. We are the specialist country that we cannot achieve macroeconomic success at all. <laughs> so I was uh, wondering, because you presented the example of Russia rebuilding uh, institutions, and I wonder if you can, you have some, I know each country has its own idiocracy, but some general features how to rebuild institutions or something, some insights or general, something that it can be transferred to uh, yeah, all countries. Well, uh, uh, 
on the first point, um, uh, Russia is understanding the fact that uh, the U.S. is no more uh, the hegemonic power uh, of the world. Uh, they are clearly thinking onto the line of a multipolar or multicentric world. Uh, they also know that when a power is going down uh, in international relation uh, as the US is now going down, this is creating the risk of very violent reaction. So uh, the main problem for Russia is first to try to persuade the US government um, to cooperate into its own downsizing and uh, the understanding of China as a major international power. And if the Russian government is not able to persuade the US government of that, then to prevent any actions taken by the US government to do harm to Russia. Uh, I think that now it's the option B which is quite obviously uh, the most important for Russia. They tried uh, to work uh, with the US government. Uh, they failed. Uh, they now, you know, when you are reading uh, the Russian literature, it's extremely important uh, to look about what words are used to describe other countries. And for the next five years, we have seen uh, the world unilateral actions uh, and things like that uh, replaced by world uh, like um, imprevisibility or even um, uh, how to translate it uh, in French and in French and, and, and English. Um, mm, well, uh, they use more or less the same words. Uh, which was used in the Soviet press about Nazi Germany in 1937-1938, which is giving you uh, the l how, how much a threat Russia is seeing that the United States are to them. It's extremely important to, uh, to understand that. After that, uh, the problem uh, about uh, exports and uh, the so-called uh, well, the greening of um, the European Union. First, um, now uh, the part, well, the share of oil and gas is decreasing uh, in um, Russian ex exports. Uh, it's important not to confuse oil and gas with other commodities, but oil and gas is slowly decreasing. Problem number two, uh, Russia is understanding that the consumption for fossil energy is to be stable or even to decrease in uh, Western Europe, but is to increase in East Asia. By the way, uh, the fact that China has absolutely no other solution than to move from a mix which was largely weighted by coals to a mix uh, where gas uh, and nuclear energy are much more important uh, for uh, its production of electricity is also a factor attracting Russia toward China because Russia is seeing China as its most important market for the next 30 years both for nuclear power station and for gas. So this is explaining also uh, the turn uh, toward East Asia and China. Um, even with Japan, uh, Russia is developing facilities uh, to transform natural gas into liquid natural gas uh, in Kurils just to feed the Japanese market, because the Japanese market is uh, using gas only 
as uh, LNG. Uh, LNG is representing 98% uh, of the total use of natural gas in Japan. So it's also uh, targeting Japan. Uh, Russia is also targeting Japan uh, in this process. So this is also very important to understand in, its, in this move from Europe to East Asia. Last point. Um, maybe you know or you don't that investment in oil and gas have considerably decreased since 2013. To the fact that investments are not enough right now to uh, provide for the surge in the production which is to be needed after 2020. We are now entering for the next six months into a time where oil and gas will be at a very, not a very, but quite a low level. But don't be mistaken, uh, by the end of 2019 or 2020, the price will go up just because the consumption will still go up, but because of the lack of investment, uh, the production uh, of oil and gas will not follow. Then, Russia has also understood that a kind of power for Russia is to have commanding aids uh, in uh, oil and gas. This is why Russia is now discussing with Saudi Arabia, whatever the difference between the two countries, whatever the conflicts which could uh, exist, and conflicts that have been a lot, mostly on Syria. But nevertheless, uh, you have now permanent discussion between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, as you have permanent discussion between uh, the Gulf states and Russia, because Russia <coughs> want to have some commanding aids in the commodity trade. Because uh, Russia is thinking that it, was, uh, it is to be uh, the most important trade for the next 10 or 15 years. Okay, okay. Do, do I go ahead? Okay. Yes, uh, hi. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm Sophie. I'm from Germany and an option B, macroeconomics and finance. Um, and I just have a brief clarification. You're talking about Russia and the Russian elite. Um, yet Russia is the largest country in the world, goes across two continents, has very different borders and very different conflicts. I imagine on its borders with its neighbors. So I just wonder to what extent um, the Russian elite and the Russian stance is heterogeneous within itself, and what is actually may like what steps are taken to manage the conflict. Like it, I find it always a bit difficult to really get insight into the dynamics of this big country. And I would just be interested if you could get some, um, if we could get some information from you on that. Well, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, basically, I wonder if so. This triangle. Sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Martin. I'm from option C, which is finance and development. I and I come from Belgium. I wonder if um, this triangle that you drew here also applies to a certain extent for international relations between states. And uh, for example, um, the relation according to economic rights, especially property rights over te technology for Russian development in key sectors, not just nat nat uh, natural resources and oil extraction, but also other industrial sectors. Um, to what extent do you think that the Russian, um, it's in their interest and their will to play it fair, or to try to, for example, from uh, firms from the Western world to get technology uh, in a way that, for example, Chinese did, which was not uh, to uh, clearly respect uh, international property and uh, property rights, etc. Okay, good question. Uh, Chris? Um, just maybe AI in one two aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just have like the answer from the speaker. 
questions, and we'll see if we have time after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't Take the microphone, please. Yeah, I asked a question about Argentina. Yeah, but you didn't answer about Argentina. Oh, okay. About? Argentina. Uh, yes, yes. I couldn't see Well, um, you, you know that uh, Russia relation, um, international relation uh, toward Argentina um, is quite open, but not uh, very, very developed. Uh, I see that uh, the Russian elite is looking of what's happening in Argentina, but only in the frame of what is happening in the whole uh, south cone of Latin America. Okay, the, the two <laughs> <laughs> the two questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Chris, I'm from Germany, I'm in Option C, also development and finance, yeah. whatever. And um, lately we were talking about the, um, the sanctions um, US put on uh, Iran again, and but Europe, Russia and China still uh, wanting to uh, keep going with the contract with Iran and therefore trying to circumvent the SWIFT system. And there was some discussions here, in, I think, in France and Germany, and we discussed it a little bit in class, but I would wonder how, like, in Russia this debate is seen, because I think it's, it's a big thing right now. I just saw, like, a short interview of Putin talking about this topic, saying, okay, we're going to this multipolar world, and um, that U.S. currency is going to have, like, less impact. So mm -hmm. how is this seen, and what do you think is the prospects for this to work? And I would have like another comment, but I can also like not ask mm. this because we have short time, right? Yeah. Okay. The last question, please. <coughs> Who do you have former put students? Okay, yeah, I'm a PhD student. Um, yeah, I just wanted to have your uh, analysis on what's uh, been happening these last days in the Kerch uh, Strait and in the Sea of Azov, and uh, if you think that it could lead to further tensions. Thank you. Okay. 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 That's all. Okay. So, uh, very quickly uh, about the Russian elite. Uh, never forget that um, since uh, the 16th or even the 17th uh, century in Russia, the elite has to be has, has ever been um, the result of the policy of the state. Uh, the Russian nobility was not the equivalent of the Western world nobility. You know. Um, uh, what is called uh, Russian nobility was very closely related either to the Tsar or to the Tsarist administration. And it's exactly the same thing right now. Uh, of course, uh, you got people like uh, the medium-sized entrepreneurs, which are developing by themselves. But in the process of development, they became dependent of the state. So um, you can't make a, a clear-cut separation between the state and the elite. However, this is working also in the reverse senses. That is, um, uh, the ruling elite is to understand uh, the feelings of the global Russian elite. And this is extremely important. Russia is definitely not a democracy right now have never been. Even under Yeltsin, it wasn't a democracy. It has some part of the, its political system which is democratic, but other part are not. But what is much more important is the fact that Russia is a, plura, a plura, 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 pluralistic system. Uh, and uh, this implies that before making any decision, the top rulers are asking questions uh, to a huge part of other people, of people uh, belonging uh, to the global Russian elite. And what is extremely important to understand, that is that right now you can have uh, some, quite, some quite important divergence uh, between Putin and uh, the global Russian elite on some and some problems. 
But if there is one problem in which there is no difference, this is on foreign policy. On foreign policy, you have uh, the same understanding which is shared both by Putin, by Lavrov, and by the global Russian elite. Um, point two, uh, in international relation, well, uh, this is uh, of course relevant, but uh, don't forget that in international relations, you don't have one power, you have a coordination of power, uh, which is changing a lot, uh, you know, uh, this graph. Nevertheless, yes, uh, I think that it is in part, um, in part relevant, and the more so when we are looking at uh, development theories. I think that the interrelation between legitimacy, cooperation, uh, and economic right still applies uh, for uh, development uh, theory. Then, uh, the way of acquiring technology, oh, that's very simple. If they could acquire uh, legally some technology, they will do. If they can't, they will do it illegally. For me, it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely clear. Um, the problem with US sanctions. Um, Russia uh, has been uh, slightly affected uh, by US sanctions uh, during this last year. Uh, there has absolutely no impact uh, onto the industrial development. There have been some impact about financial sanctions. But in return, uh, the counter sanction taken by Russia uh, on the European agriculture uh, have had a very, very important positive result for Russian agriculture. Now, how Russia is seeing um, US sanction against Iran? Uh, first, uh, they are looking at a way to circumvent this sanction, and you know it's extremely easy. Uh, if Iran is to sell uh, oil to Rasneft, and Rasneft is to sell this oil to other countries, how we can say that this oil is coming from Iran is technically absolutely impossible. So by this way, uh, I think that a huge part uh, of uh, Iran oil production will be marketed on Western markets. But now the second point is this process will make more and more iron dependent from Russia, which is a very good thing for Russia. Because uh, they could have, because of the situation, uh, a much more powerful lever uh, to make uh, the Iranian elite or the Iranian government to abide by Russian project about the Middle East. And the only thing Trump will gain with his sanction against Iran is to make Iran more and more dependent from Russia. That's all. Um, what, I, what is happening uh, in the Kerch Peninsula? First, uh, it's absolutely obvious that, uh, I'm sorry to say, but uh, it has been, at least in a large part, uh, an Ukrainian provocation. This Ukrainian provocation is to be linked to the political situation of uh, the then uh, Ukrainian president. Mr. Poroshenko is to lose uh, election if they can take place uh, this year. I think that he was just trying uh, to delete or to make election uh, to take place in the next six months or maybe in the next year because you have to know that under the Ukrainian constitution, constitu uh, election can take place when there is uh, uh, the so-called special situation or war order situation implemented in Ukraine. So you have to understand that uh, that was very probably the thing aimed at by the Poroshenko uh, government or by Poroshenko himself. It is still not clear uh, to what extent it was a move decided by Poroshenko himself or it was a move decided by the Ukrainian uh, government. 
I don't see the situation uh, worsening right now. I think that uh, we could settle for a kind of Cold War situation between Ukraine uh, and Russia. Uh, but uh, I am quite uh, impressed by the way the US government reacted. He reacted much less than the European Union. Actually, uh, the US government, which had to support, logically, the Ukrainian government, refrain to make very strong statement, which could either mean that the US government has understood uh, the trick played by Poroshenko and is not supporting it. This is quite possible. I don't know, but this is one possibility. And the other possibility is uh, they were uh, in the loop uh, for this trick they don't approve the trick, and whatever, uh, they just are letting the Ukraine go down the drain uh, in the next uh, six months or in the next year. Look about the agreement reached between the IMF and the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian government was desperately eager to get the new IMF loans. The IMF accepted the loan, well, uh, but there is one caveat. The IMF can't make a loan to a country which is at war with another member of the IMF. So th this is a very important fact, and that could cripple the loan. But still, if the loan is not crippled, the Ukrainian government has to increase the internal gas price by 43%. If the Ukrainian government is to do so, there will be a kind of popular revolt in Ukraine. So, whatever uh, the, the situation, whatever the solution, I think that uh, the US government is now more and more dissatisfied with the situation in Ukraine. And I think that this will be quickly followed by uh, the position of the European Union. The European Union, as far as my knowledge goes, um, is now more and more dissatisfied with the situation in Ukraine. So uh, I think that the best solution for everybody who will have to have the presidential election hold when it had to be hold, uh, to have a politician which is very much less opposed to Russia getting elected, and this will be, of course, Mrs. Yulia Timoshenko. Mrs. Yulia Timoshenko, which was uh, sometimes presented by the Western media as uh, the John of Hark of the independence of Ukraine, and which is actually uh, deeply involved in trade with Russia because uh, her husband is owning uh, oil refineries and these oil refineries had a contract with the Russian government. Okay. Uh, so you have to understand uh, this kind of uh, politically things uh, in Ukraine. But if Yulia Timoshenko is to get elected and if, if she is to get alive, uh, till the day of the election, uh, then, then I think that the situation between Ukraine and Russia will stabilize and will progressively improve. Of course, uh, I think that there will still be the scars of uh, the last four years between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, you are not uh, to forget what has happened on both sides both on the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side. Nevertheless, uh, I think that the election of Mrs. Yulia Timoshenko is probably the best way to lower the tension between the two countries.